Welcome to the Brute Strength Podcast, bringing you worldwide experts from all areas of health and fitness. We cover training, nutrition, coaching, and mindset. Welcome your host, strength and conditioning coach, 2012 and 2013 CrossFit Games champ, Michael Cashew. Mind, body, brute. My name is Mike Cashew, and you're listening to the Brute Strength Podcast. This week's guest is Julie Fouché. She's a multiple-time CrossFit Games athlete and a medical doctor in residency. Julie has a super interesting story because in 2013, she placed third at the CrossFit Games and then in 2014, decided to retire in pursuit of becoming a doctor. We talk about her life's work and her vision of bridging the gap between the healthcare system as it stands now with strength and conditioning and proper nutrition. We talk about functional medicine, what that means and why she chooses to practice medicine in that way. We talk about the concept in nutrition of inclusion versus exclusion in your diet. We talk about the top supplements to take, as well as the one belief she holds that if you adopt it, will have the biggest effect on your life. Julie is an absolute rock star, and she takes a really strong stance for your health in general. Before we get started, if you're new to the show, head to our website, brutestrengthtraining.com. Go get on the newsletter. That's where we're going to keep you up to date on all of the new podcasts, the videos that we put out, blog articles, and all of the free education that we give out on our website. If you're a regular listener and haven't done so already, please head to iTunes, hit the subscribe button, and leave me a rating. Let me know what you think. Enjoy the show. Julie, thank you for making some time for me. I'm so excited to do this with you. Thank you for having me. So I want to start here. Um, and I know this is what your life's work is about now and you talk about it constantly, but I really want to dive into it on this show. And that's connecting the, the medical field with fitness. Um, there's this big gap in the, the health industry where most practitioners, most doctors, their job is to make people not sick or make people mm -hmm. not feel pain anymore. Um, mm -hmm. And I look at it like kind of like an iceberg where the water is the sick line, right? And most practitioners goal is to get people just below that, that line. Mm -hmm. So they're constantly almost sick. They're constantly almost in pain. But what you're working on is connecting that with, you know, good strength and conditioning, uh, nutrition so that they can reach an optimal state. They can reach a high level of fitness so that they have a big buffer. They have this insurance against illness and pain, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it's really interesting that how you started out. So, or, or, or the transition that you made. So yeah. you, you're one of the best athletes in CrossFit sport history. And I think it was 20, so 2014, you got third place. And then 2015, you broke your foot, right? I had the Achilles injury at regionals. And so that was my last regionals. Yeah. You got eighth place with a boot, on, <laughs> which is incredible. But you made the decision to retire from competing, right? Mm -hmm. And your, your reasoning, and correct me if I'm wrong, was that, you know, med school was really cranking up and, and you were mm -hmm. your... Uh, you were in one of the hardest years and it was going to be just more demanding, mm -hmm. which I totally understand. But so many people there, I mean, there are girls and guys that are taking steroids. They're, they're cheating <laughs> in order to compete in the sport, right? Mm -hmm. But you made the decision to pull out so that you could pursue medicine and pursue your career. Why, mm -hmm. why did you do that? What, why is it so important to you that you gave up your, your career in the sport? That's such a great question. So I always say that I think I just got really lucky with the way everything unfolded. Like most things in our lives, we don't really plan them, but looking back, we can see how things kind of align in the right way. So I started doing CrossFit during the summer after my sophomore year of college. And at that time it was 2000, summer of 2009 Across the games that summer were still in Aromas and I was watching them on my computer thinking, this is so cool. It would be amazing to do this one day. And at the same time I was applying to med school. So I was taking the MCAT. I was getting ready to apply the following summer. And then 
obviously didn't anticipate, but I qualified for the games in 2010. Um, and that's the first year that they were held in Carson. And then by that time I'm already into applying to med school. So I'm like, I'm committed Mm -hmm. and turns out, you know, 2011, I compete again. It goes, well, I want to keep competing, but I'm already, then I'm, I have already moved to Cleveland. I'm starting med school and so so 2011, uh, July, end of July, Yeah, you're in the games and then you start in the fall. I started actually in July. Our program started July like fifth or something. Yeah. So that was actually, we can talk about that, but that was one of the craziest summers time, just in general times of my life. It was, um, really crazy, but I competed in the games and then wanted to keep competing. Um, so I kind of knew that it would be possible. My husband was a year ahead of me in, in the same program and I knew it would be feasible. And at that time, you know, people weren't necessarily training four to six hours a day. It was you know, something I could still manage. So I did it. It was definitely the hardest year of my life. Um, I don't think it was sustainable, nearly broke myself, but, um, kind of wanted to prove that I could do it. And then I took my second year off because that was a very crucial year of med school, big board exam, a lot more demanding. And then I basically took an extra year of med school and did two years of research in the middle where I kind of spread things out and was able to train and compete in 2014 and 2015. Um, but I always knew there had to be an end because my program wasn't going to let me take any more time. Um, I wanted to ultimately become a doctor and through this, through this whole time period from 2009 up until 2014, 15, I had really started to realize and under better understand my passion and what my purpose was and why I, you know, I felt like I was in this really unique position to be doing both and to be able to try to start to connect those dots. And so I realized the medicine part was also really important and I didn't necessarily want to compete together because I had this more long-term vision. So I always knew there was going to be an end and it kind of happened that I just didn't have a choice. So it made the decision easy. Like I wasn't going to be able to take any more time off of school or time away from school And I think if I had started competing maybe a year or two later, um, I may, or a year or two earlier, I may have delayed applying to med school and I may be sitting here today, not even having started med school yet. So I think I'm just really lucky that I started both at the same time and it happened the way it did because it led me to this path that I'm currently on that I'm super excited and passionate about. And, um, I don't think I would have been here otherwise where do you think that drive to do something um fulfilling and and purposeful comes from like i see so many people they're so driven for that glory that comes Mm -hmm. with competing um, Mm -hmm. that i don't think a lot of people would make that same decision i mean you you were so close to being the fittest woman on earth right yeah what do you think it is it is it the way you were brought up, your parents, a mentor, or just something that you cultivated throughout your life? Mm -hmm, That's a great question. So I think, and I don't, some of it I don't know. I mean, my mom always used to ask me because I always growing up used to be like just a super perfectionist and I was a gymnast and I wanted to, she's like, why do you always, why do you always have to try to make everything so perfect? And I don't know if I can really answer that question. I think when I was younger, it was just a sort of a fascinating thing to be able to strive for perfection and want to see like how close you can get to it. Um, I think there's also negative consequences of that too, that I've had to overcome later in life, realizing like, you know, when you're young, you think you can achieve perfection, but (laughs) there's a lot of other, um, things to think about as you get older and learn how the world works. But, um, I also think that there's just, and this for me is part of I think part of my, the way I view life and like my faith is I think that, that we're like all put on this earth to do something bigger and to like do something to help other people. Um, and so for me, I think that's, that's kind of what drives me to try to, to try to understand what is the purpose why I'm here and how can I use the unique gifts and talents that I have to best serve the people around me. Very cool. So before we move on, I do want to talk about that 
first year of med school. Okay. My uh, experience, like every single person I've talked to that's gone through med school, they're almost without fail. They've said like, I don't even have time to work out much less for the <laughs> yeah. big games, right? It's like the yeah. most stressful part of their entire lives. A lot of them. How were you able to do it? Like what, what boundaries did you have in place? What, what things or routines or mm -hmm. systems did you have in place that allowed you to do both? Sure. So again, this is, I think part of how things fell into place where the particular program that I was in was a very unique educational program. So we did not, it was very self-directed and we did not have any exams. We did not have any grades. Um, it's, it's a very different learning environment from what I was used to growing up and through college. Um, but what it allowed me to do was to not have periods like you would in a normal school where you have periods of extreme stress where you're trying to study for exams and then periods where um, maybe you're not as busy. But instead, it was kind of this basal level of stress and responsibility on a day-to-day -day basis to be prepared. And so that allowed me to basically establish a routine that was a little more sustainable. And it was kind of, it was also approached kind of more like a job than school. Um, it's very, it was very professional. We all had to dress up. We all had to like, it didn't feel like school. So, um, basically I would go to class. We would usually have some sort of classes in the morning from eight to noon. Most days, a couple days a week, we would have classes in the afternoon, but not not always. And so the afternoon time was more of our independent study time. So I'd usually just spend that in the library studying or working on whatever I needed to work on. And then I think I would usually go to the gym around 530 or so, um, maybe start around six. And usually I would train from like six to nine or somewhere in that ballpark area. Um, at that time I was still doing probably a lot more volume than most athletes, but now it's hardly anything compared to what people are doing these days. Um, and then I would go home, I would like eat dinner, study a little bit more or do whatever I had to do for the next day and go to bed and do it all over again. And it was very routine, very monotonous, didn't really do a lot else other than that. Um, I also really tried to maximize my rest days. So I, I would always rest on Mondays and Thursdays, which gave me two weeknights that I had off. And I knew I could kind of catch up on schoolwork on the weekends. Um, and then use those two nights during the week that were off to also catch up on school or whatever I needed to do. Um, but that was it. It was pretty boring. Like the weekends I would work out, I would do my meal prep. Um, I didn't really do much else during that year. Right. How could you, how could you, <laughs> that's a really cool way. Um, the way that you describe your program sounds like a really cool way to learn. And I think it's, yeah, that's, that's how the education system, that's the direction the education system in a lot of places is moving, right? It's like, it's much more like real life. Like you either, mm -hmm. you, you want to learn it and you learn it or you don't, and you don't get to build the skills to actually use in life. Right. Yeah, it was great. I mean, it was definitely something to get used to because you're just so conditioned, I think, through 16 years of school to study for exams and learn what's on the test. But it's much more similar to real life, and it prepares you to um, to take responsibility for your learning and to try to connect it for to, like, I'm not just learning this to pass a test. I'm learning this to help the patients that I'm going to see in the future. And the program did a good job too, of just helping you have those patient experiences really early. So you can see the impact of what you're learning. Right. Okay. So let's get back to this. You are, we're talking about bridging this, this big gap that there is in the, the mm -hmm. field uh, and getting people not, not just over pain and illness, but to an optimal state to a, to actually being fit for life. Mm -hmm. the, what are the challenges? What, what are some of the problems in the healthcare system that you face? Some of the challenges mm -hmm. that you face? And then what are you and some of the best out there doing to overcome those challenges? Well, I think the biggest challenges that we face are the system. So basically how things are set up and how the system was built was to address, like you said, to address illness and to get, take care of people who are sick. It was definitely not set up to try to maximize health or to teach people how to be healthy 
um, or prevent illness from happening. And that's why we're seeing such huge problems is because now, um, you know, chronic disease is most of what's burdening our healthcare system. Um, it's on trajectory to bankrupt our country in the near future. And our healthcare system, unfortunately, is set up to, like you said, try to just minimize the damage, but we're not, we're still not getting to the root cause. Um, and, and a lot of that is like you, and I'm sure everyone listening knows it's the, a lot of bigger societal things. It's like our food system. It's the way that our lives are set up so that we're constantly, um, it's easier to have poor lifestyle behaviors, whether it's being sedentary or being on our electronic devices all day or eating food that's convenient and not necessarily nutritious for us. So we're fighting a lot of that because as much as you want to try in a traditional system, and I'm just starting to experience this now, I'm just in my first year of residency, like seeing patients, um, and it's becoming more real to me that you can do the best you can, um, but a 15 minute office visit every couple of months or a couple times a year is not the way to help people change their lifestyle behaviors. It's just not the right environment. People need support. They need community. They need to be, um, encouraged and help, you know, to help them see that they have the potential to make these changes. Um, and unfortunately our healthcare system isn't providing that type of support right now because we're not it's not how we're being paid or it's not how we're being reimbursed and that's changing. And I think that, um, you know, we are seeing positive changes on the horizon. Um, but it does, it frustrates me with how, how slow the changes are and everything is slow to change in medicine, like slower than I think almost any other industry. Um, but I think that there is still, I mean, there's, there's pockets of where, there's enough people that are realizing this and that are starting to practice differently or starting to create different models for how we can keep people healthy. That I think that this type of change is going to come sooner than we think. Um, but talking about like the reimbursement or how we get paid, it is starting to change a little bit. And we're looking towards this model where we're going to be paid to keep a population of people healthy and basically the healthier we can keep the peop the population, the more money that we get paid. And that's more of the type of model that we want to see where you're incentivized to promote health. And when that happens, it's usually, you know, it's all driven by money, right? So when that happens, then people are going to try to find what's the best way, the least expensive way to keep people healthy. Right. That's, that's awesome. I wanted to say killer, but that would be kind of ironic. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. So what do yeah, you think? Yeah, it's exciting. What do you think about um, functional medicine? And I'll, I'll preface this by saying uh, a D and I started seeing one because mm -hmm. both of us are super healthy. And actually, I feel literally the healthiest I've ever been in my life. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm very conscious about what I'm eating, the quality of my movement, all of these things. Mm -hmm. But I've been talking to people more and more about the decisions that I make today are going to impact me in 40, 50, 60 years. So I want to make yeah. sure that for my genetics, for my um, upbringing, like all, all of those factors that I am making the right nutrition and lifestyle choices I can to mm -hmm. live the, the most uh, healthy years of my life, right? And so we got, we, we saw a guy in Austin and he sent us out to get blood work. And I'm telling mm -hmm. you, we, I've probably filled like 20 vials of blood, <laughs> yeah. right? They're testing yeah. for everything. We did like a glucose panel. Um, yeah. We did blood pressure tests for days in a row, our temperature when we wake up. And the, the, the basic concept is they're gonna, he's going to look at everything that might be a factor, like might lead to disease in the future. And he's mm -hmm. going to give us recommendations today. Is mm -hmm. that is that a field of medicine that you believe in, and 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 something that um, you would recommend to people, or where, where, what is your stance on that? Absolutely. So it's great that you asked because this is exactly what um, my husband and I want to do. Um, so just talking about the way that the stars kind of line up as you look back in the decisions you make in your life. We both moved to Cleveland to go to med school and. 
didn't re- had no idea what functional medicine was at the time. Obviously, we were passionate about CrossFit. Um, but a couple years, I think it was maybe 2013 or 2014, um, I remembered seeing something about functional medicine, and I recognized some of the names of the doctors. And so I decided they were having a talk at our at the Cleveland Clinic at our um, school. And so I went just thinking, oh, it'll be an informational talk about functional medicine. Well, it turns out they were starting the only functional medicine clinic that's ever been opened in an academic institution right at the Cleveland Clinic. And the CEO was there and all the heads of departments were there and they were introducing this to the, basically to the clinic. And hearing for the first time it all laid out about this is exactly what functional medicine is. This is the philosophy behind it. It was finally like someone, it was, it felt like I was at my level one hearing the, what is health lecture. It was like, finally someone could explain how to practice medicine in a way that made sense. And it took all the things that I knew to be true about health that I had gotten from various places, like from CrossFit or from hearing different people talk about nutrition or lifestyle or the impact of different other factors on our health. And they had finally put them all together into this nice package and this way to think about and conceptualize how to make people healthy. And so from that point on, um, my husband and I were just, we were like, this is exactly what we're going to do. And so we spent, we've both spent time shadowing there during med school. Um, and then we've started doing our functional medicine coursework, um, throughout residency. So, yeah, so we're both, and he's actually getting ready. I mean, he's graduating here soon, um, in June and that's what he's going to do when he graduates. So, um, so it's really exciting. And the reason why it's makes so much sense is it's kind of like, so the same principle as when you think about, okay, functional movement, why do we have to call it functional movement? It should just be movement. It's the way that the body is made to move, but it's the same thing with medicine. It's the way that we should be practicing medicine, but for some reason we straight off the path. So most of medicine now is looking at here's, and it, and it started because because we started trying, you know, we, we found cures to diseases. We had a lot of infectious diseases and we were able to, you know, cure a lot of these things and give people a lot longer life expectancy through, you know, like hand washing and antiseptic methods and, um, antibiotics and things like that. But that type of treatment doesn't work for chronic disease and for promoting health. Those are for more emergency catastrophic type of events. And so what we still have are using the same philosophy. So we're still saying, okay, if someone has a symptom, we're going to label it as a disease and then we're going to find a treatment for it. Instead of asking the question, why is this person experiencing this symptom in the first place and how can we address the root cause? And you see that all the time. It's so, once you start thinking about it that way, it's just mind blowing the number of the number, like how ridiculous it is when you think about the way that we treat a lot of diseases. Um, I mean, some great examples are things like depression or things like rashes, like a rash pops up and let's just put steroid cream, like basically the treatment for almost every rash is steroid cream. Like let's just, you know, dampen the immune system to make the rash go away. But why not ask, why is the rash there in the first place? Is it something that you ate? Is it something that you came in contact with? Is it something in your environment? Let's address that. And same thing like depression. Let's just, we know that, um, there's so many different reasons why people can feel depressed. Um, but the treatment is the same for all of them. It's just give them an antidepressant or same thing for hypertension. Instead of saying, why is the blood pressure high in the first place? Let's just give you an antihypertensive and fix your blood pressure. But again, it's not treating the root cause or the bigger process that's going on in your body, which we're finding out these things are really all connected. That's why when you think of like a typical primary care bread and butter patient, it's someone who has high blood pressure, high cholesterol, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, like these aren't separate diseases. They're all basically just different manifestations of the same thing, which is largely related to our diet and lifestyle. And so functional medicine is asking that bigger question of let's think about what the root cause is instead of thinking about each of these things as individual diseases or individual body systems and let's address the root cause. 
the the piece about depression is one of the most mind boggling to me. I, I've been hearing over the past year how related uh, our gut health is mm -hmm. to our brain, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's crazy to me that we prescribe so many antidepressant drugs that actually have one of the biggest side effects, or not not biggest, but a common mm -hmm. side effect of some of these drugs are suicidal thoughts. And they, yeah. they've led to a lot of suicides when the, the, the issue didn't originate in the brain in the first place, right? These people right. have really terrible diets, they're not exercising and their guts are just trashed. Mm -hmm. right. just yeah. And we can all feel this. I mean, yeah, it's, I mean, it can be super extreme and there's a lot of different factors or situational factors or certain people who are like more genetically susceptible, but like we all have probably experienced this on some level. I know I have, if I, there's, there was a time like this past summer where I went almost two weeks without working out and I was just, I felt awful. I like just wanted to cry for no reason. And then I started working out again and I felt great and I felt like myself again. And I mean, exercise is so important for our brain health, super important for our mood. Um, but now we're finding too, that it's really the inflammation in our gut that also is implicated in, in this huge connection between our gut and our brain. I mean, a lot of the neurotransmitters that we're treating with um, antidepressants and that are active um, are actually originating in our gut. So a lot of people listening to this show are in the top one percentile of healthy human beings on earth, right? They're competitive uh, mm -hmm. exercisers and people, you know, working out in their garages. It's coaches, all of those sorts of things that are really healthy, right? Would you mm -hmm. recommend people take the approach that I took and seek out like a functional medicine doctor proactively? So I think there is absolutely no harm in it. I think that the more we can all maximize, like that's our goal, right? Is just to maximize our own personal health so that we can be the best version of ourselves so that we can go out and do all the things that we're supposed to be doing and uh, making the world a better place. Like, having healthy families, um, the more that you can learn and the more that you can do to try to maximize the decisions you're making to support your health, I think the better, um, you know, you can make that same argument. And my husband and I talk about this all the time. Like, is it really, you know, there's all these people who have so much farther to go, maybe like they haven't even started exercising or they haven't, they're still eating at McDonald's every day. And like, shouldn't we be focusing our time trying to help them? But I think it's the same, like, it doesn't matter where you're at. I think that we're all just trying to get that little bit better mm -hmm. and try to be a little bit healthier. And I think that I, you know, it's, that's the beauty of this philosophy is that you don't have to be sick in order to be able to go see a functional medicine doctor and to try to see what else you can do to make yourself even better. Right. There's no, uh, there's no destination here, right? It's, it's right. literally to, to quote you and your podcast, it's the constant pursuit of health yes, that we should all exactly. be on. And there's no, like, we can't take any action today that's going to set us up for 10 years from now. We have to constantly be improving or we're probably moving backwards. It's true. It's so true. And it's back to that. Like there is no such thing as perfection. We're all just trying to get a little bit better. And like, I love that saying of progress, not perfection. And we all just are trying, if we are constantly trying to move forward and be a little bit better every day, um, I think that's what we're shooting for. And I think if, j just to speak about what your, um, the comment you made about like, you know, all, all those people are eating at McDonald's and just have a terrible diet. If they see really healthy people not taking any, like they, they don't look like they're working hard to be even healthier. Mm -hmm. it, it's like, well, rather it's inspiring to see really healthy people continuing to work on being even healthier, right? Mm -hmm. so I think in the long run, that has a, an effect on people that are not healthy, but it's just going to rub off on, on them regardless. I think it's true. I think there's also something to be said for 
Like if someone really has, I mean, they've, they've grown up, they've never been used to working out. They've never really known what real food is. It's just such a foreign concept to them and something that they haven't really even thought about. It can be super intimidating, I think, to see super healthy people and seem like, oh, they make it look so easy, but it's not. And I don't even know where to start. And so I think there's also just a lot of power in, that's why I think there's such power in community and um, especially for people sharing their stories and their experience and realizing that if say you are, you know, super healthy right now, you weren't always that way and sharing your journey and your process along the way so that people realize that we're all real people. Um, and that it's not easy and that being healthy is hard and it requires effort and it requires sacrifice and dedication. And, um, it's, but it's something that we're all capable of doing. Enjoying this episode? Hit subscribe. We have more amazing content for you every single week. This episode is brought to you by ButcherBox. ButcherBox is an online meat subscription service that sends you some of the highest quality meats on the planet right to your doorstep. I've never brought a sponsor onto the show until now because it's always been really important to me that I never promote any product or service that I don't believe in or use myself. So this year, it was one of my biggest intentions to have more quality in my life. So higher quality movement, higher quality relationships, and higher quality nutrition choices. So I figure I'm going to be eating meat every single day regardless. So why not eat it? Eat the highest quality meat I can find. And that's exactly what ButcherBox does. They send 100% grass-fed, pasture-raised, yes, super happy animals uh, that have never been given any antibiotics. Uh, animals that have been given a lot of antibiotics can really wreak havoc on our gut health. Here are some of the biggest benefits of eating grass-fed. It has higher levels of vitamins E, C, and beta carotene. There's more protein per ounce in grass-fed meat versus conventional meat. And it's going to improve the ratio of omega-6 to 3 uh, fatty acids in your, in your body. And that's going to have a huge impact on the way that your brain functions, the way that nutrients get into your cell. And it's going to reduce systemic inflammation in your body that is uh, related and uh, has, uh, is connected to a lot of different diseases and things like that later on in life. Grass-fed meat also has higher levels of CLA. Higher levels of CLA in your body improves your blood sugar levels, helps to fight cancer, and reduces your risk of heart disease. It also improves your ability to burn fat and improves your metabolism. By modulating the hormones ghrelin and leptin in your body, that's what makes you uh, feel hungry or feel full. So it's a much, much higher quality meat. And in general, in my life, I'm just taking a very long-term uh, approach. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this as a very long-term approach. The choices that I make today, my nutrition choices that I make are going to have huge effects on me later in life. Right now I'm 27. I feel super, super healthy, no health complications, but I know, and I've been told by every expert that I've talked to that my nutrition's today will impact me in 40, 50 years. So I have to start treating my body as well as possible right now. So that's why I'm choosing to eat grass fed. And it's just tastier in general. I don't know why that is, but it's a tastier cut of meat. It's higher quality all the way around. You can get a pretty cool discount if you go to butcherbox.com backslash brute, you get some free bacon, a free package of bacon and $20 off your first order. Enjoy. And with that, let's begin the show. So I've got some nutrition related questions for you. Um, okay, I'll do my best. <laughs> after, after the uh, CrossFit Games, you started mm -hmm. working with my wife, Adi. And yes. And I thought that was super interesting because you're someone that's always, you know, took such a stance for uh, eating quality food and mm -hmm. working against gravity is a, is largely based on flexible dieting, right? That's where, mm -hmm. that's where we start people with. Uh, yeah. Although there are, there is a large focus on quality it, at, in that company in particular. Mm -hmm. We start with quantity, right? So, mm -hmm. what were even before you started with a D? What was your 
view on counting macros and paying attention to quantity before you started? Sure. So I still, I mean, I still very much subscribe to kind of the CrossFit view on this. And I think that's what I've found to be true so far is that to get to, I mean, we talk about getting to wellness starts with focusing on the quality. So eating real food, eating foods that, um, are not going to be inflammatory to your particular body, um, that you can tolerate well are not going to be causing you any symptoms. Um, and that will get us all really pretty far. Um, and I experienced that I first started really cleaning up the quality of my diet in 2012 and noticed an immediate impact on my performance and how I felt. Um, and then quantity was something that I really had just always struggled with. I knew that it, so I, I do view quantity as kind of like that performance marker where, you can, like, if your goals are just health and overall well being, and you can eat quality foods and generally eat, you know, not overeat, but eat to the point that you're full and that you're happy and enjoying life, I think that for most people that can be, that can work well. But if you're in a situation where you're one, trying to maximize your performance, like a professional athlete, or two, you're really trying to get serious about losing a certain amount of weight. Um, that's when I think the quantity can become more really crucial. And I can't say, I mean, this is maybe one of my regrets. If I look back on it is not being more serious about my quantity while I was competing. Um, I played around with a zone and I would measure here and there and I would do it for a couple of weeks and then I would stop. And it was just something that never really clicked and kind of like fit into my life. Um, and so it wasn't something that I did while I was competing, but I've found, so working with a D the past, I guess it's been like maybe six or eight months. Um, it's been really insightful because I, I do feel like since I stopped focusing so much, um, or since I stopped competing, I've been still eating quality foods, but I haven't been quite as strict. So before when I would like go out with my friends, of course, I would never drink. I would never have anything that wasn't really like good foods. And now I'm in social situations. I'm much more lenient about it. Um, and so it just opened my eyes to, to starting to track open my eyes to how much I really was eating, um, like how macros wise, like how much um, am I really eating kind of a balanced diet or the proportions that I want to be eating. And so that has been really insightful for me and just to see how my body responds and how I make, like, I think one of the most helpful things for me has been just checking in with her each week and just having that time to reflect and have someone else like listen to you and reflect back about the decisions you're making about your food. And are they coming from a place of like wanting to fuel your body the right way? Or are they coming from like an emotional response or like a comfort place? And so I think for me, that's been the most eye opening. Right. Uh, one of the things I think is interesting is that, well, first off the goal, I know the goal of WAG is to have, give people the tools and the awareness so that they can eat the, the right quantity and quality of food. Right. And what mm -hmm. I've found is really there's no perfect way mm -hmm. of approaching it because sometimes you get people that they start mm -hmm. focusing on quantity and they just, they meet their macros with shit or right. there are people that are paleo that are grossly overeating almonds and you know, different right. kinds of fats and they're right. really like eating the whole tub of almond butter. Like I have been known to do once or twice, <laughs> but, Everybody um, has. every <laughs> paleo person has. But I totally agree. I think that's the beauty of it is that it totally depends. And like, this is perfect family medicine, right? It depends on wh who you're talking to and what their starting place is. And for some people, like tracking their macros is going to seem a lot more reasonable and like a good place to start than changing the quality of the foods they're eating for other people. Starting with quality is going to make more sense. And so a lot of it is just figuring out what are people willing to do and where do they want to start. And then like you said, constantly working on improving and making that progress right. over a long period of time. One of the things that I've observed, and maybe 
this is just my perspective because I'm married to a D. But one of the things that I've observed is that people seem to get really hooked faster on a, on a healthy lifestyle if they can see uh, body composition changes, right? So they learn how to control quantity mm. and they make some changes to their body. Mm -hmm. They feel confident and they also build that self-efficacy to, mm -hmm. you know, they, they say they're going to make a change and then they have integrity with their themselves and they actually yeah. stick to those habits. And yeah. then we teach them qua uh, quality and they're just so much more likely to, to stick with it, right? They have that, uh, this power of, I say I'm going to do something and I do it. Whereas mm -hmm. if they, and, and this is, it's not black and white, right? People right. are successful on both sides. But if they, if some people start with quality, the, the progress in body composition is, is too slow for some. And then they kind of mm -hmm. give up and they're kind of just doing a half-assed diet. Yeah, I can understand that. Um, I think too, though, like kind of just thinking about it from, and it, it totally depends on the person, but I think it, and it depends on the, really the type of quality. Is it really bad quality? Like McDonald's and right. like, you know, Twinkies every day, or is it something that's a little bit more reasonable? Because there's also, I think like the hormonal impacts of food and like the impact, especially of sugar, um, without, like removing that, like no matter how much willpower you have to meet your macros, it's just going to be so much harder because your brain is being basically hijacked by sugar and by your natural tendencies to want to like crave sugar and constantly keep eating um, when you're eating it. So I think there's some kind of like happy medium there um, where you have to work with like the hor trying to trying to influence your the, your hormonal balance so that you're not having these crazy cravings and not having to use ridiculous willpower that's um, really just your hormones speaking to you, um, but also being able to like figure out how you can best make progress and move forward and start seeing results. What do you think of this um, concept? I think it was this. I don't know. I don't even know what he is. He's a nutritionist or he's written some books. His name is Eric Helms. And he talks okay. about uh, inclusion versus exclusion. So most mm -hmm. diets are focused on excluding mm -hmm. foods, right? Don't eat sugar. Don't eat, yeah. food, don't eat dairy. Don't eat carbs. Don't eat fat, whatever it is. Don't eat it. And you'll, mm -hmm. and you'll be healthier, right? What he says is, focus on and actually before i even say that the problem with a lot of those diets is if i tell you don't think of the color red you're gonna think of red yeah yeah we focus on not doing we're also mm -hmm. focusing on right mm -hmm. so we're more likely to kind of crave those foods especially when we have like a cheat night or we have like a vacation right like more likely to and like overindulge Mm -hmm. What he suggests is to focus on including healthy foods. So mm -hmm. as many whole foods, a variety of vegetables, probiotics, um, you know, organic and grass fed meats. Mm -hmm. If you fill the majority of your diet with those foods, a little bit of one of those items that you're you know, mm -hmm. not supposed to eat is not going to kill you if the rest of your diet is solid. How, what do you think of that? Right. Oh, I completely agree. And that's, I mean, that's kind of the approach that we like to take, like for our, this year we did our, our big, um, healthy self reset. And that's like exactly our philosophy is trying to focus on new, incorporating new foods, being excited about like trying new vegetables, about trying new recipes and making it exciting. Because I think, so many times when people go on these challenges or they like try to change their diet, they go to just basic, this is what I know I can cook. I can make chicken and broccoli and sweet potatoes and eat that for four meals a day. And then it gets really boring really fast when food is so exciting. And the more variety that we can bring in and the more vegetables and color, the more nutrients we're getting and the better we're serving the function of our entire body. And the more you think about food as information for your, I mean, not just your 
you know, for weight loss, but think about it as information for all of your cells. It can turn on and off different DNA in each one of your cells. It can affect your hormones. Um, and the more we can give that good information and good inputs, the better we're going to feel. And then really health happens as a result. Like weight loss is going to happen as a result as your body's healing and it's, and it's getting the nutrients that it needs. Um, and so that's kind of the philosophy that we always take is just try to focus on incorporating those healthy, nutritious foods and fueling your body with the, the nutrients that it needs um, instead of focusing on restriction or, you know, specific. I mean, there are certain foods that we can like all agree are not very helpful for us, like sugar. Um, but like you said, inc included in small amounts when you're also getting lots of good nutrients, it's not probably as harmful as it would be otherwise. So people look to you as like the epitome of health. You're a CrossFit <laughs> Games athlete. You're a doctor. You take such a strong stance on eating quality food. Um, I would imagine that that creates a feeling of pressure, right? Like you have to live up to people's expectations. Is that... Is that true for you at all? And if so, what does that feel like? I would say to some degree, I think that I'm oftentimes way too hard on myself or harder on myself than I probably should be. Mm -hmm. Um, because I do think that I want to, I want to practice what I preach. I want to be able to be an example for people. And I think as a doctor, as anyone, you can't really recommend for other people to do anything that you are not doing yourself or haven't tried yourself. Um, but I also have to like, remember that I'm human and that there are other, like I'm a first year resident. I have so, a lot of other sources of stress. I don't always get seven to eight hours of sleep. I don't always work out five days a week and that's okay. And that's kind of the place where I'm at in my life because I've, shifted my focus and my focus is right now on residency and learning medicine. And so as long as I'm doing my best in that and doing the best I can to kind of maintain my own health, it's all that I can ask for. And it's all that I, you can ask for from, every, from anyone. Like you can't, we can't all be perfect. If you followed every single recommendation about how to be healthy and you got eight hours of sleep and you meditated for 20 minutes twice a day and you cooked three meals a day and picked the food from your garden and like hunted all of your, all of your fresh meat and, um, like spent time with your family and your community and went to church and like all these things, there would be no time in the day to do, to work or do anything else that you need to do to like provide for your family. So you know, we all have to just figure out what's the best way to incorporate these things in our lives. And like you said, it's a process. It's not, we're not going to be perfect. We're just trying to get a little bit better. Right. Well, if we, if we lived that way, we wouldn't have to provide anything else for our family. <laughs> That's true. If we could, <laughs> yeah, if we could have gardens and yeah, but then, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if I could have lived that long ago where we had to do that. <laughs> I have so much I'm respect sure for could. people who who grew and hunted and cooked their own food. You would have figured it out. This is, a, <laughs> this is a slight tangent, but I think it's so fascinating. Uh, I read this book, Tribes, recently. Have you read it? I have not. Oh, my God. Just uh, an incredible book. One of the most interesting parts in this book is that when – when settlers were, you know, fighting with Indians hundreds of years ago, mm -hmm. taking their land and shit, uh, there were zero, so a lot of the there were a lot of cases where Indians uh, like abducted the settlers, right? There were mm. there was all this fighting, and there was there was a lot of abductions happening. Okay, a ton of cases where the uh, Americans tried to take those people back. Right, like like free them from the mm -hmm. Indians, and they there were a ton of cases where they did not want to leave. There were zero cases huh. where um, where Indians, where whereas in the reverse, where Indians tried to take okay. people back, they, yeah, they didn't want to leave. Right, interesting. So yeah, super interesting that you know we just I think we're our brains evolved to to like that lifestyle, like a close network mm -hmm. of people, mm -hmm. you know, eating, eating healthy food, a very mm -hmm. simpler lifestyle. 
So that yeah, that's my little tangent for the day. <laughs> I love it. I'll have to check it out. So I don't think I've ever asked this on my podcast because I I usually don't really believe in supplements for the vast majority of people. I tend mm-hmm. to think, you know, you, unless your diet is completely dialed in and you're and you're focusing on on quality and quantity yeah. of food and you're doing everything right, then maybe <laughs> think of supplements. But I'm really interested to hear your take on them. Do you take any supplements and if so, what? That's a great question. So, and I will say that I have a very similar philosophy. So I think, and I, you know, the best analogy that I've heard to explain this is like thinking about you have a big jar and you need to put put the big rocks in first. And those are like your food and your sleep and your lifestyle and exercise. And then you can put in the smaller pebbles and then like the sand or the fine details and the supplements. I think a lot of them are just like the sand. Like if you don't have other big things in place, they're probably not going to make a huge difference for you. Um, but they can in certain situations, um, can help. And I think, and also in informed situations. So when you know which ones you really, your body really needs. So I have actually been working with Puri, um, which was formerly Pure Pharma since 2000, I want to say 12. But the reason why I have been working with them and why I love them so much is because they have this philosophy and they started out with just fish oil. Um, they make one of the cleanest fish oil products on the market. Um, and I've seen a lot of them and their fascination was really with this omega three, omega six balance and realizing that in our diet, even, even when a lot of people are eating healthy, just because of the depletion of nutrients from our diet and the fact that a lot of our meat, unless you're eating like purely grass fed meat and like farm fed fish and all that stuff, um, or not farm not farmed fish. Um, you're, we're st- most of us still have a higher balance of omega sixes to omega omega threes, and the omega threes are more of the anti-inflammatory balance. And so, um, fish oil is one that I take, and I took more when I was competing and when I was training hours a day because I think it just helped um, to decrease inflammation. Um, but I think for a lot of people that can be helpful. Um, but not everyone, like if you're eating a healthy diet, you're eating fish in your diet, you probably don't need to take a omega three supplement. Um, the other big one is vitamin D and we know, I mean, most of us are deficient in vitamin D. I live in the Midwest. I don't know if it's the same in California or like sunnier places, but I know in Cleveland, most everyone is deficient in vitamin D. And that's a, that's when vitamin D is actually a hormone and it's, it's, really important in our immune system and our immune response. And if your levels are low, um, I mean, there's a lot of different, it's also important in our bone health, but there's a lot of different, um, implications that that can have. But I think one of the biggest ones that I think of is in our immune response. And even the other day I was reading about just like remedies for, or functional medicine or natural remedies for cold and flu. And a big one is having a vitamin D level that's below the normal limit, um, puts you at higher risk of developing flu or not basically having worse symptoms. So vitamin D is something that you probably want to at least have checked and make sure that your level is in a optimal or you're, you're in an optimal level. And if not, you may need to supplement. Um, those are probably the biggest two. I think, Magnesium is one that can be helpful for people in recovering, um, especially if you're working out a lot. It's good for muscle recovery. Um, And then certain ones, I mean, there's also some decent data on vitamin C in preventing cold and flus or in cold and flu season, which is why people are always crazy about taking vitamin C when they're getting sick. Um, I think that... Overall, like those are the big ones that I think of for the majority of the population. But the other beautiful thing about a functional medicine approach is that you can actually check a lot of your levels of different nutrients and see where your imbalances are, what nutrients you might need specifically. Um, And to address those, I think the first place I would go would be to your diet. So just trying to figure out which foods are higher in those nutrients that you could incorporate more into your diet. And then, you know, if needed, you could go to supplements. Love it. I, uh, it's very reaffirming because when, when people like really press me for supplement advice, 
Oh, yeah. Okay. Zinc, magnesium, B3, and fish oil. That's it. Yeah. There you go. Awesome. That's all you need. <laughs> so I've got a few rapid fires for you, and then we'll wrap it up. All right. Rapid we'll fire. see. I don't know how I feel about rapid fire. Oh, they're very easy. <laughs> Do my best. What book have you given as a gift most? Oh, um, I think The Language of God. It was written by Francis Collins, who's the director of the NIH, and he also was a leader in the Human Genome Project, an incredible scientist. Um, and he set out to basically write a book and prove that, use science to prove that God doesn't exist. And he came to the opposite conclusion. And I read that in college, and it was really um, impactful for me at the time. And I've gifted it to a lot of people. Is it just English, the language of God? The language of that, yeah. I'm just messing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just. Took me a second there. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> uh, what belief do you hold that if others held would have the biggest impact on their life and performance in general? Oh, gosh. Um, I think just this is something that maybe is just intuitive to me. But I generally believe, I always kind of believe the best in people. Um, and sometimes it's hard to see, but I usually, I just try to always give people the benefit of the doubt and try to put myself in their shoes. And I think that if all of us did that, I mean, I'm not saying I'm perfect. I certainly, there's times where I don't do that. But I think if all of us did that, we the world would be a much happier place. I couldn't agree more. I think that... Uh... You know, if I was born with your genetics and your life experiences, I would literally be you, right? <laughs> you were just born. In it's true. Like, there's so genetics. many. It's so true. It's so true. What's one action that you'd recommend people take immediately? Oh, I say do 25 burpees first thing when you wake up in the morning. Okay. It's the best thing I ever started doing. It will change your life. Why? Because it's the best way to start the day. Like, so many people are so used to, and myself included, we're so used to just waking up, rolling over and looking at their phone or seeing their emails or their text messages and getting this immediate stress response. Um, waking up and just getting your blood flowing. If you're, even if you're super tired and your alarm goes off, you wake up, you do 25 burpees, you feel like, all right, I'm ready to do this. What's one thing that you stop doing that you think most contributes to your success? Hmm. That's a hard one. Yeah, hard one for someone that's been perfect their whole life. Oh, okay, not perfect. <laughs> a lot of things, but I feel like all my bad habits I still do to some degree. Um, thing that I've stopped doing. Well, this is one thing that has been kind of from my husband that has rubbed off on me. That's been a great, <laughs> a great thing is, um, I've. I don't know if I can turn this into like stopping, but he's basically a much more of a neat freak and like super organized in our house. Um, and I used to always, I would just like kind of, I didn't mind mess cause there was always something more important to be doing. So I would like, you know, let the dishes go or like yeah. not clean up and like hoard things in my closet yes, yes. Um, because there was always just something that seemed more important to me to be doing than to cl be cleaning and he is very much the opposite and has taught me how great it feels when you have a clean space and how much better you can think and um, that has been really good so I don't know if that's something I stopped doing but I stopped being messy <laughs> that's huge that's huge I think uh, yeah. I talk about this a lot actually that if, you know, we have the CrossFit pyramid where nutrition is the bottom, right? Yeah. The productivity period or uh, pyramid, I yeah. think your environment is at the base mm -hmm. of that pyramid. And so it, it is your, um, you know, your lifestyle, your, your sleep, all of that stuff, as well as your physical environment, like your, is your place tidy? Yeah, because it that's affects, so true. It affects what's going on in your mind if you always have this feeling like I have to put that stuff away eventually, then it's mm -hmm. just taking up space in your mind. It's so true. Uh, we read this book, The Magical Art of Tidying Up. Yes, I was just thinking of that. I haven't read it. I think oh, I have. Oh, gosh, it's so good. Yeah, I mean, I remember seeing it when it came out, and I think I have it somewhere, but I haven't read it yet. It's a phenomenal book. 
Okay, that's all I've got. Julie, you're a fucking rock star. Thank you so much for making time for me. Um, I just want to say I really appreciate everything that you do for the community and the stance that you're taking for um, human beings in general and, and all of the work that you're doing. I really, really respect it. So thank you for all of your time. Where can people find out more about your programs, your podcast, all of that stuff? Well, um, the best place to find me is juliefouché.com. It's pretty easy. Um, everything is pretty much linked through there. The podcast, um, you can find the program there. It's also at trainwithjuliefouché.com. Um, podcast is on iTunes, everywhere else that you find podcasts. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. On social medias, that's where you can find me. <laughs> you, just, you just started selling a program that people can do at home as well, right? For people that are super busy, can't get to the gym. Well, actually, that's coming soon. But our so our program is actually it kind of was born out of me being done competing and wanting a super efficient program that I could do. And so it's great for it's basically sixty minute timeline, but it's all encompassing kind of full GPP, full weightlifting, gymnastics, everything. Um, and that's something that'll it works well for someone who's in a garage gym. Um, who just needs some accountability. Like we have a timer that kind of keeps you on track for the whole 60 minutes um, and have a great community. Um, we're working on a program that will be much more accessible with like very minimal equipment that people could do at home as well. Cool. So that's coming soon. Julie, thanks again. I really appreciate it. This is great. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. Your journey towards better fitness continues. Head over to BruteStrengthTraining.com to connect with Michael and his guests. Access links and resources mentioned in this episode, as well as bonus content exclusive to podcast listeners. That's BruteStrengthTraining.com.